back to The Dancing Professor. Today we're going to continue our lecture on memory. So hopefully you've watched the previous lecture on sensory memory, short-term memory, and working memory. And now we're going to uh, finish talking about long-term memory. So as an overview, we're going to discuss how long-term memory differs from short-term memory. We're going to talk about the different types of long-term memory that actually exist. We're going to talk about the important process of actually getting information from short-term memory into long-term memory, and then equally important, getting it back from long-term memory to short-term or working memory. And then lastly, we're going to wrap up by talking about the different parts of the brain that are responsible for, making, for forming long-term memories. So long-term memory is defined as an archive of information of past events in our lives and knowledge that we have learned. This covers a span from 30 seconds ago to as old as your earliest memory. So if you recall from our previous lecture, short-term memory lasts anywhere from 15 to 20 or 15 to 30 seconds. After 30 seconds, everything else is considered long-term memory. So long-term memory depends predominantly on semantic coding, and we learned again in our previous lecture that semantic means, uh, refers to the meaning of different types of stimuli. So we often use a combination of short-term memory and long-term memory in our daily experiences. For example, when you're having a conversation with a friend or when you recognize someone you know. You're, in, you're activating your long-term memory because you're actually uh, recognizing the person with whom you're speaking, right? You did not just meet them unless it's like Drew Barrymore in 51st States. Um, but again, we're talking about the healthy mind with no particular disabilities. Um, so, of course, if you're talking to somebody you know, you, you have experiences um, conversing with this person. You have met him or her before, so that information is stored in your long-term memory. The conversation that you're actually engaging in at the moment would be an example of short-term or working memory because it's happening within those 15 to 30 seconds. Um, additionally, in long-term memory, we have what is known as the serial position effect. And this says that memory is better for items at the beginning of a presentation and at the end of it versus in the middle. So why do we think that is? Well, we have this concept of primacy where people um, have more time to rehearse items and transfer them to long-term memory if they occurred at the beginning of a list. So if you are trying to uh, remember that silly song, The 12 Days of Christmas, and uh, you're counting, with every day you're adding more and more things and, or gifts that you had received, um, probably the first gift that you received will be the one that will be remembered the best because you will have 12 different times to repeat it. Conversely, we have this uh, concept of recency, which is things that appear at the end of a list. And the idea behind remembering these better is because the information that occurred at the very end of the list is still, in, is still active in a person's short-term or working memory. So, of course, if, if you had just finished singing the song or you had just finished hurting what was the last gift on the 12th day, that information is still maintained in, in your short-term memory within that 15 to 30 second period. Um, therefore, you're more likely to remember it. So the things in the middle tend to get lost because you haven't had as many times to repeat them because they did not occur at the beginning. And they've also um, gotten occluded, right? Now you have this interference by information that has come after it. So that's why um, primacy and recency are the things that drive the serial position effect. Neuropsychological evidence shows that people can have functioning short-term memory, but not long-term memory and vice versa. So in a sense, that means that you actually have long-term memory, but you're not able to make new memories, right? So your short-term memory is affected. And on the other hand, people can have functioning short-term memory, right? So they only live within those 15 to 30 seconds, as we've seen um, with the case of Clive Wearing. Um, but people can no longer form long-term memories because uh, the transfer from short-term to long-term memory is damaged. Um, so what does this tell us? How is it possible that we can have one memory functioning and one not functioning? Um, well, basically, that could tell us that there are different parts of the brain that are regulating these two parts, uh, these two different types of memory. So um, long-term memory, right, is divided into a variety of different things. So metaphorically speaking, you can think of your long-term memory as a giant filing cabinet. And in this cabinet, you have various drawers. Your two top drawers are non-declarative and declarative. 
In non-declarative, you have things like procedural memory, such as riding a bicycle, right? Things that re require a process. Um, you have motor skills, right? Things like driving a car or writing or drawing, things that require you to work with your hand. Um, and you also have emotional memory um, as part of non-declarative. The converse is the declarative uh, storage cabinet, right, or drawer, I should say. And uh, declarative memory is important for episodic memory, right, things that have happened to you in your life, personal experiences, as well as semantic memory, which is like knowledge and memory of dates and names of people and things like that. So um, if you are not a visual learner and you are more of a verbal learner, um, this is sort of the same thing that we just saw in, in the other picture, but just with words. And here we, they're calling uh, declarative memory explicit and non-declarative memory implicit, right? So there are certain things that we do that we can do without thinking about them. We just remember how to do them, right? Sort of like riding a bike. Um, things that we uh, could be primed with or things that are just a result of a reflex. But basically implicit and non-declarative memory is sort of related to that automatic processing that we had learned about in the previous lecture. And explicit and declarative is more related to controlled processing where you're actually having to try to retrieve that information from long-term memory. So declarative memory is a conscious recollection of experiences or events, right? And this includes episodic memory, personal events in your life. And this also involves mental time travel. This is known as self-knowing or what we call these days as remembering. Semantic uh, memory is facts and knowledge. So, for example, um, if I ask you what year did World War II begin in, um, knowing a piece of information like that, you would be calling up on your semantic memory. Um, semantic memory involves knowing things such as vocabulary, numbers, concepts, definitions, right? A lot of the things that you learn in school are stored in your semantic memory. Semantic memory does not involve mental time travel, but actually on a daily basis, we use a combination of both episodic and semantic memories. So if you started telling a person um, like, oh, you know, I'm enrolled in this online class and I have this teacher that doesn't just force me to read a textbook, but I actually get to watch video lectures and she interviews a bunch of really interesting people and her show is called The Dancing Professor, right? So that's an episodic uh, memory, right? You're recalling something that you've experienced and maybe you're telling your friend about the video lecture that you watched yesterday. Um, so you're talking about things that you've experienced in your life, but then you start telling your friend about the origins of human factors and how, um, you know, design is a, is a really hot topic these days and how people really struggle in, in the uh, industry to create pretty designs but functional at the same time. So that is a semantic piece of information that you've learned from class, but you learned it based on some particular experience that you've had that you are now conveying to your friends. So that's a perfect example of how you can combine an episodic and a semantic memory. Um, knowledge that makes up semantic memories that but we initially attain through personal experience, right? So of course, um, you had to learn the information somewhere at some point. So of course you had to be present for that to happen, hence the episodic part. Um, so it's not, it's not a surprise that episodic memory and semantic memory go hand in hand. Um, but personal semantic memories have a personal significance and they are remembered better. So for example, probably, uh, you know, if you had a sibling that was born and you were old enough to remember when that happened, that is a personal semantic memory. Um, you will probably remember the date and the time. Um, perhaps your graduation day is important. Maybe the time that you had your first date, right? The first movie you watched on that date, you know, the time it was when you got your first kiss. Um, so anyway, all of those things, right? Things that have a personal meaning, a personal value for us, and more specifically, some emotional attachment, those are the memories that are remembered better. What's interesting, though, is that memory for an experience can fade, but a semantic memory will remain. So a perfect example, for me at least, is um, I remember that when I was in, um, I believe, elementary school, I remember that I learned fractions. I don't remember who exactly my teacher was. I don't remember 
the clothes I was wearing that day. I may not even remember the classroom, but I do remember for the rest of my life how to calculate fractions from that day forward. So learning and being able to actually calculate fractions is the semantic part of the memory, but actually remembering my personal experience of where I was and how I felt and that particular day, that is the episodic memory fading, but the semantic memory remaining. So um, the second type of uh, long-term memory we have, right, the second shelf, the second uh, um, drawer, is the implicit non-declarative memory. So this is uh, suggesting that previous experience improves performance on a task without our conscious use of it. So something like repetition or priming um, increases our uh, response time, right, so we're able to react faster and we're able to do things more accurately because we've recently been exposed to it. So if I gave you a test on the things that on long-term memory that were like tomorrow, then you would probably be able to do well on it because you've just been primed with so much information about it. Um, and so, you know, speaking of tests and exams, we have this concept of recognition versus recall. So uh, to recognize something is often easier than to recall it from scratch. So recognition involves involves uh, the presence of options or cues in which there is one correct answer among the answer choices presented to you. But recall involves actually remembering stimuli from scratch. So if you think about it, um, a multiple choice question is sort of like recognition where you know one of the answer choices is correct and it becomes easier that you just have to identify which of the choices in front of you is the correct one instead of having to come up with an answer on your own. Something like uh, writing an essay question or a fill in the blank or a short answer, um, that is, involves recall because you don't have any options, any answer choices to choose from and you actually have to uh, come up with it from your long-term memory. So people with long-term memory problems still perform better on a recognition test after continuous exposure even if they have no recollection of ever being exposed to it. And this is actually really, really interesting. So um, imagine that you're a person that cannot build long-term memories, right? You are someone that you, you live within 15 to 30 seconds. Your life is within short-term memory. And so let's say I will show you this bottle of water and it is called Crystal Geyser. And um, I will show it to you, you will read for me what it is and then I will put it away. An hour later, I will show you this bottle and I will say, have you ever seen it before? You will probably say no. And I will tell you, okay, it's called Crystal Geyser. So on and so forth, over and over and over several times. Then if I provide <clears throat> you with a variety of different water bottles, such as Crystal Geyser, Sparklets, and Arrowhead, and I ask you, which of these bottles have you seen before? You're more likely to say Crystal Geyser. And then I'll ask you, have you ever seen this bottle before? And you will probably still say no. So um, that is an example of how people still are able to do better in a recognition test even when they're not conscious that they had been exposed to that stimulus in the past. Um, so procedural memory is another part of non-declarative memory and this is the memory of how to do things. And of course this typically involves motor skills but you don't re actually remember how the skill was learned. Um, and so we have this thing called the propaganda effect where we are more likely to rate something as more favorable simply because we've been exposed to it before. So it's called propaganda because it's very much related to uh, voting and campaigns and things like that where people may not know a lot about the candidate but because the name looks familiar they're more likely to to vote for him or her. So um, Oftentimes when we've done something over and over and we, we no longer remember who taught it to us or how we learned it, but we sort of know about it, then it uh, allows our memory to perform that task or that function um, to require less cognitive resources and become more automatic. So um, now we're going to talk about actually inputting information into long-term memory from short-term memory. Storing information in long-term memory is a question that everybody always has and more importantly we're always trying to figure out how to improve our memory. How can we make it better? So first it's important to understand where uh, information input starts, right? What is the starting point of information processing? Well, acquiring information and transforming it into memory is called encoding. And if you recall from our short-term and working memory lecture, 
we learned that taking information from sensory memory to short-term or working memory is called coding. And there were three ways that we could do that. We could do that auditorily, visually, and semantically. Once that information has successfully made it into short-term or working memory, it actually must be uh, moved or transferred, right, or encoded into long-term memory. So encoding is storing of information in long-term memory, and coding is storing information in short-term memory from your sensory memory. Transferring information back from long-term memory to your conscious working memory is called retrieval. So that shouldn't be too complicated because to retrieve something is to bring it back. Um, and the main goal of cognitive psychology is to actually find the relationship between encoding and retrieval. Because essentially, uh, the best predictor of whether or not you'll be able to remember something and to bring it back to access in your short-term or working memory is how you encoded it. So how do we actually attempt to remember things? Well, <coughs> there are two different types of rehearsals that we typically engage in. The first one is called maintenance rehearsal. So um, just based on the title, right, to maintain something, to do it over and over, you know, uh, so it, with maintenance rehearsal, you're maintaining information in your memory through repetition without actually considering the meaning of that information. You're also not making any connections to current information that you already possess. So what is an example of this? Um, probably uh, if you're trying to memorize a phone number, right? So you repeat the digits to yourself over and over and over. Once you've actually made the phone call or written it down, you no longer need that information, right? So the opposite of maintenance rehearsal is called elaborative rehearsal. It even sounds fancier, right? To, be, to elaborate is to focus more on the detail, right? To be more meticulous. So elaborative rehearsal is when you actually think about the meaning of information and you're actually trying to make connections to things that you already know. This is critical in transferring uh, information to long-term memory more effectively. So for example, Instead of trying to memorize the words maintenance rehearsal and elaborative rehearsal and memorize the definitions, it would be much smarter to actually look at the word, right? To maintain something and to elaborate on something just by understanding the definition of, the, of those words. If you know the meaning of the word elaborate, right? Or to elaborate, you will understand that that requires much more focus to detail. You can then apply that and make that connection between knowledge and of this definition that you already possess and new information that you've learned and apply them to each other. You can also make connections between the things that we're talking about now to the previous lecture on short-term memory and sensory memory. Again, this is all revolving around memory, but if you just try to memorize different bits of pieces or chunks without any sort of clear, meaningful way to intertwine them, then your transfer to long-term memory will be uh, much more complicated. So um, this brings us to the level of processing theory. This theory says that the memory of information depends on how it was encoded or at which level of depth it was processed at. So we have two different levels. We have shallow processing where we pay very little attention to meaning and we focus mainly on physical characteristics. Whoa, that word was really long. Whoa, that word was really short. Oh my God, I can't pronounce this word. Um, that word is hard. I don't understand it, right? So. We pay very little attention to the meaning and we don't make those connections to information we already have. Deep processing is the opposite of that and it actually involves close attention, focusing on an item's meaning and relating it to something else. So which type of processing do you think would have better recall results? If you're thinking deep processing, then you're probably right. You can also say that shallow processing is much more related to maintenance rehearsal and deep processing is much more related to elaborative rehearsal. You can further say that shallow processing and maintenance rehearsal do not involve controlled processing, but deep processing and elaborative rehearsal do in fact involve controlled processing. And so um, we also have this theory of transfer appropriate processing, which says that memory performance is enhanced if the type of the task at encoding matches the type of the task at retrieval. So what does this mean? This is that whole notion that whenever you're studying in school, um, you should probably study 
in the way that you think or that your professor at least will tell you your test, test will be formatted. So if you are going to be presented with short answer questions on your exam, you should probably learn the material in that way. If you're going to be presented with multiple choice questions on your exam, you should probably also um, encode information that way. So you want, you want the encoding, the first, the initial learning of that information to match the way that you're actually going to have to retrieve it later. So again, uh, the way information is presented in this class is the way that you will be asked to recall it on an exam, such as filling in the blanks, giving examples, things like that. Um, additional factors that help encoding um, are creating images. So uh, we know uh, that things that can be uh, applied to an actual a physical or tangible object are more likely to be remembered. But again, it's totally up to each individual. If to you, if to one person, uh, the concept of, let's say, the scientific method is like, you know, a picture of a magician or Harry Potter with a wand, you know, that might help you trigger your memory of the scientific method. For someone else, it might be a flowchart. So any images that you can create that can help you remember a particular concept will actually help you in terms of retrieval. Um, relating a word, item, or concept to yourself is called the self-reference effect. Anytime that you can apply something you learn to, to your personal life, to yourself, that's why I often like to give you guys examples from my personal life, um, that also really helps to remember because you're sort of personalizing what is a semantic memory to make it more episodic, more emotional, and we know that those are key um, in improving memory. <clears throat> So you yourself provide a retrieval cue that links um, to that item, making it much easier to remember. Because at the end of the day, sorry to break it to you guys, but we're pretty selfish human beings and we're all, always thinking about ourselves. So if we can think about ourselves to trigger um, the memory of important information, you know, more power to us. Generating material yourself, coming up with examples, asking questions, answering questions, these all activate what is called the generation effect. So <clears throat> You, you'll notice how oftentimes in our lectures I will uh, pose a question. Um, I will ask you what is your opinion about something. I will ask you to provide an example of a particular um, concept that I had introduced. So by doing so, by engaging in this generation effect, by creating your own material, you are actually building more neural connections with this information that will help you retrieve this information letter, later. Sorry. Um, uh, organization of information is very, very important. You may not know this, but we as humans spontaneously and automatically organize information in our mind if it is randomly presented. So you'll notice that when I present my PowerPoint lectures to you in tandem with um, what I'm saying, uh, they're pretty much always organized in some sort of a, a logical and intended way. We always start with a title slide where I introduce the topic. We always then continue with an overview slide where I tell you what I'm going to tell you because uh, I feel like it's uh, more interesting and I feel like it's more efficient and effective for you to know what you will be learning about before I start deeping into the, uh, dipping into the deep details um, of the lecture. After that, we also have um, organization even on this slide. We have a bolder, larger title at the top to sort of indicate that this is the overarching theme. We have um, a smaller bullet point that is introducing a topic, and then we have smaller bullet. Uh, we have other bullet points below that that are introducing subtopics that are explaining the the larger topic. Additionally, you will notice that I have bolded some words. Probably those words are important, and I feel like you need to know those. So there's organization all around us. You may not notice this, and you may not be consciously aware of why I'm doing it, but it is actually automatically being stored in your brain and in your memory in this exact same way. So um, all of this information on long-term memory will probably live in a separate place from the information from short-term and working memory from the previous lecture. Your brain will not smash the two together because they have been presented to you in two different lectures. <clears throat> So memory can be improved if the original presentation of information is organized. If it is presented in an organized way, it will be retrieved in an organized way as well. And so um, this is directly related to your studying habits, right? If you, if you just take all of your subjects and you start studying them, you know, a page from here, a page from here, a chapter from there, um, that's not a really efficient way to work. 
you want to try to categorize and organize your studying and your learning. Um, and not just, you know, while you're in school, but in general in your life. Anytime that you want to increase your capacity for what you can remember, organize your information first and you will see how much better it will be. Um, so how does this actually relate to um, knowledge, categorization, and the spreading activation of, of neurons? Well, we know that knowledge is stored in various categories throughout our brain. And uh, knowledge is, is basically all of our experiences. Everything that you know, um, you've had to have experienced. Otherwise, there's no way that you might know it. So knowledge is stored in various categories in our brain. And when you can think of one category, it automatically triggers activation in another category. So for example, if I tell you our topic is memory, or if you have to take an exam on memory, then you'll probably remember that, okay, I have this larger category of memory that will then activate the various types of, of lectures of memory that you had. So, so far you've had long-term memory, sensory memory, short-term memory, and working memory. Those are four different things. And from there, you can branch out and activate even more specific categories. So basically, the way that you organize information from the get-go, from the point of encoding, will determine how well and how successfully you will be able to remember that information and to successfully retrieve it when it's time for you to use it. So now we're going to talk more specifically about retrieving information from long-term memory. We know that retrieval is the process of bringing information back from long-term memory to short-term or working memory, right? Once memories are effectively encoded and physiologically stored, we can actually bring them back. So failures of memory are actually a failure of retrieval. So um, why do we need to bring it back to short-term or working memory? Well, again, short-term and working memory is the present, right? It is in the now. So essentially everything that I'm telling you now whether it was from one slide ago or whether it was from a lecture a year ago, that is still an example of me bringing it back from my long-term memory. I am retrieving it, and as I am speaking it to you right now and projecting it on the screen and we're having this conversation, it is remaining active in my short-term or working memory. When I finish this lecture, it is going to go back home to my long-term memory. So we have these things called retrieval cues that help us retrieve a stored memory due to some sort of an association or to a link of that particular concept to other things. So when we talked about um, the self-reference effect, we also mentioned that we ourselves act as a retrieval cue to trigger this information. So location is another really um, common uh, retrieval cue. For example, if you can't find a particular object or you can't find your keys, for example, the common thing to do is to physically return to the place where we thought we had it the last time, right? And to sort of look around and, and something in your environment may actually lead you to, um, you know, it might, just, it might just snap, it might just click. And you'll, you'll see something and it will act as a trigger for you to remember where you in fact put your lost item. Um, so hearing, right? We have hearing or smell, all of these things are actually acting as retrieval cues. Um, Maybe if you hear a song that you, let's say, have been rehearsing for several, several months for a particular dance performance, right? And that song is so ingrained and embedded in your head and you're like, ah, let's use Despacito. So I don't know about you, but I feel like I've heard that song a gazillion times. And so uh, every time that song plays, right, uh, everyone has a particular reaction to it. Some people love it. Some people are sick of it. But I guarantee you, five years from now when it is no longer popular as soon as that song comes on everybody will immediately remember um, remember the melody will remember the words maybe we'll even remember the really scandalous music video the dance that goes along with it um, but basically hearing something can can trigger um, very very vivid memories also smell I remember that um, a long time ago uh, I was dating this guy and he had this really, really delicious smelling cologne. Um, and again, that was many years ago. And to this day, when I, when I sense that smell, where, whenever I'm out or even at work or something, I immediately see a picture of him and I'm immediately reminded um, of my experiences with him and whatnot. And so not, you know, not in a bad way, but you know, almost in a bit of a nostalgic way. But the point is that 
uh, my sense of smell, right, and smelling that particular cologne um, has ingrained such a strong memory of him that, you know, it's very difficult to erase it. So it's serving as a retrieval cue when probably nothing else would remind me of him um, as strongly as that smell. So um, we also have, we talked about recognition versus recall, but now we are actually going to talk about two different types of recall that we have. One is called free recall and one is called cued recall. So free recall um, is recalling a stimulus without the presence of any other information, right? So cold turkey, totally from scratch. Cued recall is when you're presented with cues to aid in the recall of previously experienced stimuli. So cued recall is different from recognition because in recognition you actually have the correct answer or the correct possible choice presented to you among a variety of distractors. But in cued recall, you're just given some sort of a retrieval cue to help you remember it, but the actual correct answer or the actual option choice is not presented to you. Um, we have this concept of encoding specificity, which is very interesting, that says that we learn information together with its context. Furthermore, it says that the best recall occurs if encoding and retrieval occur in the same location. So again, going back to what I'm sure you've heard about studying, um, they tell you to study in a quiet, focused environment because that's m more often than not the kind of environment that you're going to be taking your exam in. So you want to mimic your uh, environment that you will have, in which you will have to retrieve your information from long-term memory, um, and you want it to be the same. You want it to be the congruent environment in which you originally learn it. So um, additionally, related to that is state-dependent learning. Learning that is associated with a particular emotion, um, with a particular mood or state of awareness, right, also should be congruent when you are learning information for the first time and encoding it or studying it, and then when you're actually asked to retrieve it. So um, better learning occurs if the encoding and retrieval occur in the same sort of state of mind. So for example, if you were really angry when you were trying to uh, learn information and encode it and then you are no longer in that mindset when you're actually having to retrieve the information um, it may be not as optimal but probably would make more sense if to say that you were in a better mood you know you were in a fine mood you were focused you were attentive uh, when you were learning information for the first time and then let's say on test day you overslept you showed up to class late and you're upset with yourself and you feel like um, you suddenly forgot all of the information, your mind is preoccupied, you're going to be less likely to retrieve the information accurately. Um, so these are two interesting examples. Um, this is just to serve as a retrieval cue for you to remember state-dependent learning. Um, again, you can consider state-dependent as a synonym for emotional, but here I'm showing you a variety of different emotions to sort of act as a retrieval cue for, to trigger your memory of that theory called state-dependent learning. Um, here on the left, uh, this is related to encoding specificity and it's related to an experiment that was conducted um, where divers had to read a particular passage and we, the, the researchers wanted to see how well they remembered it. So again, the idea of encoding specificity is for the environment at learning to match the environment at recall. So. If the diver was on land learning the information and the diver retrieved and recalled the information on land as well, that led to good recall. When the divers learned the information underwater and recalled it underwater, that was also um, accurate and good recall. However, when the diver learned the material on land and then had to recall it underwater, that resulted in poor recall and in worse results. And conversely, when a diver had to learn it underwater and recall it on land, that also led to worse results. So, I mean, you can imagine learning things underwater and recalling them underwater is difficult uh, is a difficult concept on its own. Um, but it's very interesting to see how uh, this is actual uh, data from this particular research experiment. So, um, you want to match the environment in which you learn to the environment in which you're going to be recalling. So, lastly, we're going to talk about the brain and long-term memory. So again, we're always trying to improve our memory. You're always hearing people tell you, oh, you know, you got to solve crossword puzzles, you got to keep reading. So it's true, but there is a logic um, to this truth. 
So where in the brain do memories form? Well, the physiology, physiology of the memory begins at the synapse, right? So the synapse is uh, placed in the neuron uh, where one neuron meets another neuron, right? Information is transferred from one neuron to another neuron by, via an action potential. So if there is enough of a firing of neurons that occur, the information will pass from one neuron to the next. If it doesn't, the neuron does not fire and the information does not get passed. However, this firing of information, this processing of information occurs through the synapse. So a nerve impulse will travel down the axon, which is like the long tube part of a neuron, and a neurotransmitter is released onto the next neuron. The synapse becomes activated and actually causes structural changes. So the neurotransmitter releases and then there is a physiological change that occurs between the two neurons. Um, there is increased firing and of course a memory will occur when the structural synaptic changes will build new proteins and will essentially connect the two neurons together. So uh, information in our brain is stored in neural circuits, right? So you could think of these as like a plethora of like webs connecting a variety of different neurons. And information is stored in these neurons and more importantly than being stored, it actually travels back and forth um, through these neural pathways, through these circuits. So um, the more often that you recall particular information, the faster that firing will become. So long-term potential or long-term potentiation um, suggests that there's enhanced firing of neurons after repeated stimulation. So if you are constantly repeating over and over um, or constantly retrieving the same information over and over, again, that enforces structural changes and it enhances your response time. So if you're constantly um, asked to provide your student ID number, right, that's a long, that's like, a string of, I don't know, 12 numbers or something. Maybe the first time you had to look at your ID to rewrite it, the second time, the third time, but by the fourth time, you probably have it memorized because you're using it so much. So um, it is important to note, however, that memory is not permanent. Um, sometimes we believe that it is and that once you know something, it's really hard to forget it, but there's this really important concept of reconsolidation. And reconsolidation um, says that memory is susceptible to change each time it is retrieved. So the question becomes, is that a good thing or a bad thing and why? So if you go back to thinking about your student ID number, for example, um, and you've retrieved it from your long-term memory, it's currently in your short-term working memory for you to be able to write it down. When you're finished with the information, you send it back home to long-term memory. But what if you made a mistake and when you were sending it back home to long-term memory, there was an error that occurred. So now, um, on its way back home, it took a wrong turn and now it remembered one digit incorrectly. And from that point forward, you are now going to retrieve the memory incorrectly with this inaccurate digit. So reconsolidation occurs um, and it could be bad in one sense. However, it can be good in another sense because it's also a way for us, uh, for us to be able to fix our mistakes. For example, if you know that um, 2 plus 2 is 5, right, you're like super sure that 2 plus 2 is 5, you counted it, you calculated it several times, um, but then one day you learn that in fact you were wrong and that you finally understand that 2 plus 2 in fact is 4 and it is not 5, your ability to reconsolidate that old existing memory to learn to adapt to something new is a good, uh, good aspect of reconsolidation. So again, memory is not permanent, it's malleable. Um, it's bad in the sense that if you don't use it, right, it eventually gets, information gets forgotten or it deteriorates or you, in, you start experiencing interference, right? Um, but it's also good that it's not permanent because it, you have the ability to change and to fix mistakes to learn new things, to increase your neural circuitry, right? To, to make processing faster, to generate things related to yourself, to ask questions. So every time you do something like that, it, of course it enhances your memory, but it, you're also increasing the number of neural circuits you have. It is a common misconception that you can actually make more neurons. That's in fact not true. What you can do to increase memory and functioning is to build more neural circuits. 
And the way that you would build more neural circuits is um, just as we've been mentioning pretty much this whole entire lecture, to be able to take new information and connect it with older existing information that you have. You can almost think of it as a highway. So imagine that there's one road that you constantly use to travel home. Um, is it possible that there are other ways to get from where you are to where you, where you live? Sure. But because you're not aware of that other route, you'll never take it. And so if you're constantly taking the same route and then one day, you know, there's construction on that route, what are you going to do? Are you going to just sit and not end up going home? That's the time when you would probably investigate another route. Of course, that will take more time, but you'll eventually learn that other route. So in case you ever do experience an obstacle on your primary one, you will still have another way to access your home. Same thing with information. The more neural pathways you have between various pieces of information, the faster um, your memory will work and, and the more solid your memories will become. So it's all about building those neural pathways. So amnesia is loss of memory and um, retrograde amnesia is loss of memory for events before a particular trauma. And terograde amnesia is loss of memory for events after a particular trauma. So if you remember the case of Clive Wearing, um, he was able to recognize his wife and he remembered her Additionally, he remembered that he did have children, but he did not know how old they were. So why is it that he didn't completely lose all of his memory? Why is it that he could still remember his wife and the fact that he had kids? Well, that's probably because the trauma occurred after those events in his life had passed. So he lost memory for events um, after the trauma, and he lost memory of some events before the trauma, but he still maintained... Uh, the memory of information of who his wife were and the fact that he had kids. He had no more uh, ability to formulate long-term memories. He was only living within the present, within short-term memories, to the point that every day he would wake up and in his diary he would write, today is the first day that I've been awake. And then the following day he would scratch it out and rewrite the exact same thing. And he would deny that it was in fact him who wrote that sentence the day before. So in that sense, he has anterograde amnesia where he has no ability to formulate new long-term memories because he's constantly stuck in this short-term memory period. So is memory for recent events more or less fragile than memory for remote events? Meaning, do you feel like it's easier to remember things that happened a long time ago or do you think that it's easier to forget memories that happened um, more recently? Well. Um, this is actually an interesting question. So basically, before memories become resistant to disruption, right, before they can become n uh, not fragile and, you know, pretty strong, they actually have to be consolidated or con transformed into a more permanent state. So again, even if we look at the word consolidated, it sounds like a longer, more complicated word, but the root of that word is the word solid. So if you're thinking about consolidation, right, that means to harden, in a sense, a memory, right, to make it not fragile. And then when we talked about reconsolidation, the fact that memory can change, that's a way to change a solid memory into another solid memory, right? So consolidation occurs on two levels, at the synapse, right, of the neural synapse that we talked about, and also on a systematic level. And when we say system, we mean the entire brain. So synaptic consolidation occurs at the synapse, and this takes just a few minutes. Again, it, it, it's related to the action potential, to the firing of neurons, to the synthesis of new proteins, and to the release of neurotransmitters. A systems consolidation involves a gradual reorganization of circuits and brain regions, and this takes weeks, months, and sometimes even years, right? So all of the information that you're acquiring it's constantly changing, it's constantly building these neural pathways, and it's constantly getting harder and harder, um, in a sense, more solid and solid, for uh, as long as you keep um, making those neural connections. So the standard model of consolidation says that memory retrieval depends on the hippocampus during consolidation. However, retrieval depends on the entire uh, cerebral cortex after consolidation, and so the idea behind this is that activation is distributed across various areas. I know we didn't really talk about the, um, 
different parts of the brain and how knowledge is stored across those parts of the brain, but we did discuss how information is stored in various categories. And those categories do not only live in one particular part of your brain, right? You have these neural circuits throughout the entire brain, and so wherever there's information, that's where memory will become activated. So that's why it involves the entire cortex, not just a particular synapse of a few neurons. Reactivation um, is when the hippocampus replays that neural activity that is associated with the memory. So in a sense, reactivation connects the hippocampus with the cortex. So this typically occurs during sleep or relaxed wakefulness. So if you're someone that's constantly wired and drinks way too much coffee, especially like pulling an all-nighter, um, that's probably not going to benefit you in remembering anything at all because your memories will not be consolidated. You will not be engaging in that elaborative rehearsal. Your brain needs to sort of power down to be able to um, absorb all of the information that you're trying to feed it. And it can only do that when you're sleeping or when you're fully and completely relaxed. So um, sleep is very, very important when it comes to memory. So eventually, these um, cortical connections become very strong, and the hippocampus is no longer necessary to relay the information. So we've been talking um, theoretically and metaphorically about these, you know, memory working in these different modes or boxes. But essentially what's happening is that um, information needs to travel through the hippocampus. The hippocampus acts as sort of like the messenger between long-term memory and short-term working memory. Um, as long as consolidation is still at the synaptic level. Um, once, once those memories have become consolidated, right, once they've become more, more firm, more solid, and uh, not fragile, then the hippocampus no longer becomes necessary, and they do not need to travel through the messenger. The neurons simply transfer the information to each other on their own. So recent memories um, are activating the hippocampus, but remote memories, much more distant, longer memories, they are solidified in the entire cerebral cortex or in the system of the brain. So here is just um, an example. This is the hippocampus, right? And if you notice, it's uh, located in the temporal lobe, which is pretty close to your ears, right? And so um, this is the cerebral cortex. Um, so when we talk about the cortex, we're talking about neural connections all the way throughout here. But when we're talking about the synaptic consolidation, um, that's when the hippocampus uh, comes into play. So lastly, something really interesting about emotional memories is related to the amygdala. The amygdala is a massive nuclei responsible for processing emotions such as fear, pleasure, and anger. It also determines which memories are stored in which parts of the brain. Um, and again, this is totally based on the emotion um, a particular experience invokes. Long-term potentiation, as we spoke about, triggers mechanisms in the amygdala, which actually help us remember emotional events. So if you think back to your very first memory, more often than not, that memory is going to revolve around some sort of emotional event. It's going to be some sort of episodic emotional memory. And I just wanted to point out that this is the amygdala and its roommates with the hippocampus. So hippocampus is critical, as we just learned, in synaptic consolidation, right, when memories are first being formed. And so if the neurons um, that are responsive to emotion are directly attached to the hippocampus, which consolidates those memories, it also is not that big of a surprise for why we remember emotional events so well. Um, so. Yeah, I hope you guys uh, enjoyed that, and I hope you understand long-term memory a little bit better now. Um, thanks again for watching, and I hope that you will be able to apply some of the things that we discussed today um, to better increase your long-term memory capacity, to increase your response time for retrieving important information. Um, and, you know, please share this with friends and family. Um, sort of break the myths about why uh, long-term memory is effective and why it is not. Um, and so, yeah, if you have any questions, again, there's the email, and uh, I hope to hear from you guys soon. Thank you.